Hello, Ender Sword here again, this time with a tier list of all these ships available in Star Trek Fleet Command. There's currently 91 ships available for players to build and use, and I wanted to go through what the general utility and usefulness of those things are to players, which things maybe you should focus on, which things you can ignore or skip, uh, and which specialty ships and things like that uh, you should be pursuing, and hopefully help you plan uh, your future in the game. I'm going to be doing this relatively within shipyard order. So if something is way outside the range you're looking at now, you can kind of skip forward, skip ahead, uh, or skip back, whatever, based on what your uh, utility is. Um, you know, myself, I'm at 59. When I get into the high 60s and 70s, that's probably not going to be too useful to many people, but I figure I'll go through the entire list um, and, and talk about them all. So the criteria that I'm going to be looking at is one, how long is the ship useful to you? So basically the shelf life of it. There's some ships that are kind of only useful for a couple levels. You may only be using them for a few weeks, a few months, and then you're kind of going to mothball it uh, versus other things you may be using for many months, if not years, uh, that they still have a utility in the game. Uh, we're going to be looking at largely the relative strength of a ship. So obviously if we had just went by pure strength, then the level 70 ships are the best. And then you just kind of go down from there, but that's not very interesting. So it's more, how does a ship compare to other things at a similar level uh, and the level you're at, what is the utility of that thing going to be? Because there are things that are in the 40s or 50s that are kind of duds compared to some of the other ships and may be something that you want to skip uh, and just kind of move past. Uh, we're going to be looking at utility in terms of special abilities, refineries, research trees that are available, particularly for the specialty ships um, and how useful they are and whether that's something you want to kind of go after right away or maybe let slow drip or even just completely skip. Uh, so one of the things I'm going to be talking about, though, a fair bit here is firing pattern, uh, which is going to be relevant to a lot of ships. And I know that not everyone is totally familiar with what this is. So if you go to stfc.space, uh, or I think a number of other websites, but this is the one I tend to use the most, um, it will show you the firing pattern of a given ship. So this is the firing pattern for the Voyager um, and you can basically then compare it to other ships and get the way that it fires during uh, combat. So in the first round here, it's going to fire its first energy weapon two times. It's going to fire the second energy weapon it has three times and then not fire the kinetic weapon. The second round will be the same. And then in the third round, it's going to fire those as well as the kinetic weapon four times. So basically, it's not hitting its strongest in round one and two, but then it's putting out a massive amount of damage in round three, where it fires everything, and then it kind of repeats that uh, every three rounds. You can then look at what the weapons actually are and get a sense of the relative strength of that. So the two weapons that are here firing every round have, and this is at uh, tier 12, have a minimum damage of 27,000 and a maximum of 32. 2732 but the weapon that only fires once every three rounds is multiple times that we've got this uh, basically four times stronger uh, and it will fire more shots for 119,000 and 143,000 so you can basically look at your fight and say okay I'm going to be lighter in the first couple rounds then fire a big shot and the reason that that matters for a lot of ships is, of course, hostiles are trying to hurt you at the same time you're trying to hurt them. So sometimes ships that have a bit of a slower ramp up to what they're doing, like this is the Talios, fires one weapon, one weapon in round one, two weapons in round two, and then all of its weapons in round three for a big shot. So that means when you're attacking something, it's you're doing less in the start and it's getting a lot of hits in on you. So in something particularly like PVP, it really matters that their your opponent is potentially firing all their weapons in round one and you're only firing a fraction of them and then ramping up later in the fight. Uh, and against hostiles, again, that could definitely matter uh, because
Whereas if they've got strong round one or two weapons, then maybe you're not killing it in round one, whereas a different ship could, uh, things like that. So there are generally ideal firing patterns that we're looking for, and the best firing patterns tend to be front-loaded ones, where it is firing everything or almost everything that it has uh, very quickly in round one and then repeating that pattern fairly quickly. Uh, but there are many different types of these patterns. So I'm gonna be talking about that throughout. Uh, just didn't want anyone lost because it is often the thing that people don't totally realize is making a ship good or bad. And it particularly matters what the meta is uh, on current PvP. PvP fights have gotten very, very short because of all the extra isolytic damage. They often only last one or two rounds, mostly one uh, at the high level now. So if you've got a firing pattern that doesn't shoot everything round one, you can be putting yourself at a disadvantage. So I'll get to that as we go, but I wanted to, uh, to cover that off since I know that not everyone is familiar with that. So Again, I think I'm going generally in shipyard order uh, here. The first ship, which I'm going to place confidently in an A, uh, because one, you just get it for free at the start of the game anyway, and it has some fun utility to it, is going to be the Rialta. It's one of the fastest ships out there. I think it is actually the fastest ship uh, if you've speed crewed it and you've got the skin that adds impulse speed to it. You can get the impulse speed of this ship well over 500 uh, at this point. So it is a very, very fast ship. It could completely cross a system in under 17 seconds now. Um, so it's just good for going around tagging things quickly it can be really annoying in things like territory fights you can just run away from anyone that doesn't have that sort of impulse speed and keep yourself alive um, and it's actually regained some usefulness in the wave defenses it is now a perfectly valid strategy to throw a speed crew on a rialta uh, particularly if you're a lower level player and go around and do nothing but hunt the surveys while some larger player uh, kill the other hostiles in the waves. You can make yourself useful by getting from side to side quickly and taking out those quicker surveys uh, better than some other people and free up the larger players to, to go for it. So A may be a tiny bit of an exaggeration, but it's it's got a lot of character, especially since they've added the two skins to it. It's useful for a few events. There's a few events like PvP and those racing ones they did where you just need this ship. I don't think you can scrap it at this point anyway, and it's not optional, but it's a really, it's the, one of the ships with the most character, so I'm going to put it uh, there in the A category. The Orion Corvette is basically the second ship that you get. Um, I'd put it, when you get it, it's relatively... It's relatively innocuous. I'm going to put it in a C here. Um, it's not super strong. It just has a little bit more tankiness to it uh, than the Rialta did. So you can kind of fight slightly higher levels when you're first starting the game. But if you're someone that's already watching YouTube videos, I'm sure you're already well past this. Uh, and you would oat level this ship probably within, to be honest, a few days of playing. Uh, you're kind of done using uh, that sort of thing. But it's there, and it's a nice introduction to kind of how to build and uh, and tear up a ship. The Fortunate is half decent. I'm going to put it in the C category here as well. It's your first survey ship uh, where you kind of learn about mining, things like that. It's a par steel miner. You're not going to use it for too much other than to set it out and sit on a node in order to complete some missions that you have to do in the early game. You're not really going to fight with it, uh, anything like that. And again, you're going to replace it relatively quickly. You're, you're probably not going to uh, use it for too long. The Findra is a tiny bit of a, I think I'm going to end up with a lot in C, at least in the low level ones, because there's nothing amazing, but there's nothing terrible uh, here really either. So Findra is uh, your first interceptor available. It has a bit more combat ability. You can start getting into slightly higher ships, send it slightly further, uh, and start really kind of exploring the galaxy with it. But again, it's relatively weak. It's not that much stronger than the... Uh, than the Corvette was. You can see kind of the starting power 
on those. It's not really a leap up. It's also the case that for these ships, uh, particularly getting into the Findra and the Taurus, which I'm going to put in the same category, you're not necessarily going to tier these ones up that much. You might get them up a tier or two, and then you've already leveled on to the next point in the game, and you don't need these ships anymore. So it may not be something that you're going to spend resources or time on. You're just kind of going to use them for what they're worth for really a few days or maybe a couple weeks, whatever it is, and then get on to the next uh next level now the jellyfish the original jellyfish i'll probably put into a b again you're not going to use it that long but it, 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 it is something that you're going to have to either buy or find in an event store if you happen to be starting the game at a time uh, that an event store is available then it's something that you want to pick up in terms of spending real money on probably not super worth the investment you can if it's not a big deal to you uh, but you're not going to use it that long in terms of months and months at a time you're kind of going to out level it a bit but it definitely is superior to some of the other fighters uh, that you're going to have available to kill hostiles uh, at that level um, so it does get an advantage there but the one that i will put that is uh on that same tier and is not something you have to buy is going to be the tala uh, this is a lot tankier than both the Findra and the Taurus before it. And this is probably the first one that I would say for that level, you're probably going to want to tear up uh, a fair bit. It's going to be your hostile grinder in kind of those low level ranges for a little while. And unless you go for the next ship, um, which would be, I'll, I'll get to it in a second, but the North Star, then the Tala is going to be the one that you're going to keep for uh for probably a while. The Envoy here is kind of your first early miner. Um, and again, you can afford to tear it up a little bit because you can scrap it later uh, for three-star resources. It does convert into three-star uncommon materials uh, and that can be useful. So if you do tear it up, trying to get some more mining done at the low level, that's not a wasted effort. You can always uh, recover some of that value and convert it to uh, to three-star materials. It's also a fast miner in terms of impulse speed. So again, you will sometimes see people send these out when they're in like a war or for territory fighting or something as just a cheap, really easy to repair ship. And they'll send it out to nodes to do mining. And then they know if somebody kills it, if somebody's either OPC hunting or at war with another alliance or something, you can lose that and it's a really easy to uh, replace ship, but it will still get some mining done for you. The next is the USS Franklin. In this one, I'm going to put the actual ship in a D because the Franklin doesn't even do what the Franklin is supposed to do well. So the Franklin is obviously supposed to be designated to killing swarm ships, uh, but it is not really that great at it and it's actually relatively time consuming to repair compared to some of the alternatives and in terms of the efficiency of grinding with it. So it does okay as you're trying to kill low level swarm, but generally speaking, any explorer ship that you have around the same time does just as good, if not better a job at killing the swarm. Um, so they still get the triangle advantage against the interceptors, but the Franklin itself is weirdly long to repair. I remember it being like a 12 hour type repair, whereas your fact, your, your other main ships are not like that. Um, so you, it's something that you kind of just need to level up because you need to eventually max it out in order to convert it to a Franklin A, but the ship itself just kind of sucks. And you're almost always better off using just a normal Explorer with a good crew as opposed to the original Franklin. And then it's not until you get to the Franklin A that it starts to become more efficient. So this one, this ship feels a bit like a speed bump to me and it feels like a relic of like just a really old uh, ship from the game long ago that there's a new version of, but they didn't do much to kind of reconcile the old ship uh, that didn't work that well. The Botany Bay is kind of a one trick pony. You're gonna use it to uh, mine your data. That's all it's really good for. It is a really fast uh, impulse speed ship as well, but that doesn't really 
matter <laughs> that much. Uh, it even has extra research and everything that increases its impulse speed. But given that it's ultimately a survey ship, it's not entirely clear why that was even necessary. I think that that existed or maybe was programmed back in the day when they expected the chasers to be a bigger part of data mining, uh, that you would have to evade them or something. But of course, there's ways to just turn the chasers off. You can either kill them or use the warp trick to get rid of them, and you don't have to move the ship around. So you're still just going to go plunk it on a data node and then leave it there. So the whole way that this works is kind of weird, and the research around it for like the uranium efficiency and things like that are also kind of weird because you really only need to just, it's relatively fast to tear up and max out. Uh, so it just doesn't feel like it, you, you need it. But uh, it is what it is. It's for that one thing. It does that one thing better than anything else. So you're going to have it, but it's not something that you're going to use beyond that uh, in any sense. Now, the North Star here I alluded to before. This one is... Again, unfortunately, either a paid ship or if you're lucky enough to be playing uh, and get to this level when there is an event store coming, uh, then you can usually end up buying the blueprints in that. This ship is really a lot better for, it's kind of a jack of all trades thing and it can carry you a fair bit into your like late 20s and still be doing the combat pretty well. So it's kind of like a combat survey ship. So it's got some of the best three star mining speed but it has a relatively small cargo and a small protected cargo. So you can go out there and get one or two loads uh, of uh, a node and then get back home but you can't repeat you know 10 nodes full of it uh, to collect resources, but it is a combat ship as well. It's gonna perform as good, if not better, than some of these other ships uh, before it. And again, you can just tier this up, and because it's also good as a survey ship, if you take this all the way to tier nine, your resources are fairly well spent with that, and there's still gonna be instances well into your late 30s that you're gonna still break that out to help mine a node uh, or it will have some utility for you. And at the end of the day, if you do want to scrap it, then uh, you can still uh, scrap it as well. But it's one that I've always just kind of kept around because it is a way to just go out and grab some, uh, some materials quickly or raw materials quickly. The Kara here, I really like the Kara myself. Um, I think in terms of the firing pattern it's relatively it's kind of the first good semi-strong interceptor i've actually used the care in pvp to kill with the you know strike team crews and everything to kill things up to about a 20 million kelvin um it can do remarkably well just because of how the firing pattern does work and how the interceptor officers uh, work on ships like that. Uh, so it's surprisingly strong uh, in some senses, but as a hostile grinder, it doesn't have super durability, but I think it's one that you can kind of, uh, you know, take a little bit, um, you know, tear up a bit, you'll get some utility out of it and, and so on. But it's not the strongest thing in the world, but I, I guess it's got a soft place in my heart and I'll stick it at the B. The discovery here is kind of a long-term investment. It feels like something that is almost useless up until you get to about level 40. And then in the 40s, when you start to struggle with warp range in deep space, particularly with your miners, you're gonna find this really useful. But it takes such a long time for you to get to the point that you can summon other ships with it. The discovery itself can jump around relatively early and you can use it for that, but it's not really a combat ship um, in the traditional sense. You're not gonna use it to fight much and it can't drag the other ships with it right away. Once you do finally get to the point that it can summon other ships, you start to see the usefulness to it, but it takes a long time to get there, like an oddly long time to get there. They've also recently added primes to it that extend its warp range into the thousands, uh, well above 1,000, so it will continue to have usefulness in uh, the five star and six star, but only if you buy those primes and they did it as a five tier prime, which seems 
excessive. Uh, so I haven't personally done it and I don't see the super use of doing it. But I do remember the discovery being very valuable uh, using it to help me mine and collect four-star resources in the 40s. The other utility that it really has is um, is going to be for PvP. There are times when you get a mantis sting on you and you cannot warp out. The discovery summon can warp you out of that situation. So if someone has stung you and you're going to be killed and you can't escape from it, then you can actually uh, use the summon back and you can warp your own ship out and keep it out of danger, uh, you know, dock it and go back without the sting on you. So there are cases there where it can help you uh, evade a bad situation. So it has some utility there. But as a ship on its own, not much. And it's just a weirdly long a weirdly long time if it wasn't for the summon itself i would put this in a d or an f but obviously the summon is 90 percent of what you're really probably 98 percent of the value of the discovery and i do know some people that will keep two of these um they'll buy extra ones in the event store or something and uh and basically have one that they keep at home and one that they will bring to a point so that they can basically create their own personal wormhole to summon them back and forth. The uh, Voclis here, this one's fairly decent. I'm gonna put in the C category as well. You're probably not gonna level this up too much uh, just because there's a better explorer coming. But in the meantime, again, this can outperform the Franklin just in terms of killing swarms. It's a half reasonable ship. It's got a decent firing pattern, um, you know, so not too bad, not too great. Um, it's got what I call like a flat firing pattern where it's just kind of the same thing. Uh, and yeah, just a decent grinder, but you're not going to use it for too long. It's not too fancy and there's nothing too special about it. The Devor here, I'm going to put into the B category uh, as a ship for combat or something. Obviously, you're not really going to use it to fight, but it has a specialization, which is to mine Latinum. And the real key and benefit of mining the Latinum is then to convert the raw Latinum to actual usable Latinum that you can use for speed ups and parts and things like that that you need. And that's something that you need to be tapping into if you're a newer player uh, relatively quickly. You're going to find that there is a huge crunch on how much Latinum you need to buy common ship parts or buy uh, speed ups or keep your ships repaired, things like that. Um, so tapping into that Latinum cycle early and getting this ship leveled up is definitely going to be really important. And the fact that you have to tier it up to tier nine in order to then be able to scrap it and transform it into the Devor Fisha, uh, which is the concentrated Latinum miner, which then unlocks even more refinery uh, is also important. So as a ship itself, it's kind of cool. Uh, I have always kind of liked it and liked the Frangi type uh, stuff with it, but it's utility in terms of giving you a free supply of daily Latinum just for doing the refines is definitely good. Um, so definitely uh, a valuable one there. The Kumari is a pretty decent grinder uh, for its level, but I don't think that you're going to, again, keep it for all that long. Um, so it's probably, I, I've got to put that one in a B. I think out of the ones for that sort of tier, the Kumari is probably the one that you're going to, uh, to tier up the most. It's got some utility. It's got some durability. It's got a fairly good hull on it. So you can take it out as a hostile grinder and get a lot of kills before you're destroyed and, uh, and have to repair at home. Uh, but it's not outstanding or anything. The Meridian is, again, a utility miner. It really only has that one use. Unlike the uh, Devor, it doesn't transform into anything else. Um, it's got a little attached refinery to it that can help you get extra particles from the territories. So particularly if your alliance like has one 
type of particle and you need some of the others, it will give you a slow drip of those other particles that you haven't gotten. Or if you're just not in territory at all, it will help you convert some of your uh, ISO into those particles so that you don't necessarily have to be there, but you're not 100% locked out of that territory tree. So it's got utility there. It's obviously the best ISO miner, but it's not shockingly faster than some of the other ships. It's a fair bit faster, maybe three or four times as much, but it's not like the fecia with the or the devor with the latinum where it's like 20 or 30 times faster than something else it's just a slightly better ship and uh yeah it just has slightly better utility to it uh than a normal miner so it's still valuable but i'm going to put that one in a c and again i think i'm going to end up with an awful lot of c's the vidar uh is probably going to go into a b for me it's one of the ones that you do have to do the work. You have to level it up, um, refine. Actually, to be honest, I may push this to an A because of the refinery itself. It will give you extra uh, faction credits. Um, and it's also going to be the source of some of the things you need to level up the Borg officers and things like that, which add utility to it. It used to be kind of a main OPC hunter as well. It's been eclipsed a little bit by the uh, Vidar Talios, which is the next iteration of it. But certainly through your uh, 30s or your 20s and low 30s, uh, this is going to be one of your go-tos. It's the only way to really go kill probes efficiently uh, is to use the ship. So it does have some value, and it's uh, one of these ones too that's a specialty chip that doesn't really take that long to level up if you just kind of put in the work and use the tokens. Um, and do your refines, it's going to level up relatively quickly. It's just a matter of staying on it. And then once you kind of max it out, the refinery that you get from it is going to be useful pretty much for the rest of your gameplay experience. So I've had this max for probably literally three years now, and you still do the refinery pulls uh, every day out of it. And it eventually leads into the Borg solo uh, armadas and things like that. So it probably is in that A category in terms of the utility uh, for it, even in the long run. The Horizon is a pretty good miner. Um, it's, again, something that you're going to get relatively low level. Uh, you're going to be able to tier them up. You're not going to want to put too many resources that are taken away from anything else you're doing in your base or other ships. But it's something, again, that you can be using. You get it in the 20s, and you can still be using it well into the 40s um, to mine three-star and even four-star stuff. It can, once you've tiered it up, it can at least hit those low four-star systems. You can use it with the discovery to get it places that it kind of shouldn't be uh, and still use it. It's not that much slower or anything than the later faction miners. So it actually is still quite viable uh, throughout. It's something that you're going to end up with a million uh, blueprints of anyway. And then if you did end up leveling up multiple of them, you can always go back and scrap some as you don't need them anymore. And you're going to reclaim a lot of those three-star resources. Uh, but it actually is fairly decent. Even at this point, I've got a couple of them that I keep around in case I decide to just do eight dock mining uh, on a given day, but they're cheap, uh, relatively easy to tear up, and they do retain their usefulness for quite a long time. It, from the moment you get them to stop using them, for sure it'll be over a year uh, that you end up having those things kind of in service. Now we're getting to the, uh, the mid-20s faction ships, and I guess this is the first tier of faction ships really available. Uh, the D3 here is... It's an okay ship. It's not like the best in class. It only fires kinetic weapons, so it doesn't have any energy weapons in case that matters in some PvP combat and some hostile combat. I would put this one, though, in a C. It's an interceptor, so it's a little faster, but the its firing pattern isn't the best, and it's just not one of the best of the three. I think it's the worst of the three in terms of what you'd pick for your hostile grinder. Um, also, the fact that it is a Klingon ship, the game, particularly in the early game, has a strong tendency to push you towards 
the federation and you're going to find that you often have the most credits on the federation side and the most faction on the federation side unless you strongly push against that so it's one of the ships that's almost hardest to divert yourself uh to get to um on the Klingon side. So if you like it, go for it. It's not a huge difference, but I think out of the three that you're looking at, it's probably the worst. Uh, the next one up is the Mayflower, and I think this one is actually the best uh, of these three for a couple reasons. So I think it has a relatively good firing pattern. It's on that Federation course. It has the highest like starting power uh, of these, and often power can be deceptive, but, but it does. Um, and it has the fact that it's an explorer also makes it your natural replacement for the Franklin should be killing swarms, but you can use the Mayflower instead to kill swarms. And that tends to be a better way to go in terms of efficiency and how, how well you're doing. So I think the Mayflower kind of takes the best of the three uh, for this group of faction ships. And I'm going to put the Legionary in uh, C here as well, along with the D3. There's nothing super wrong with it. It's actually the way that I went uh, when I was first playing through is to go with the Romulan ship, but it's not the strongest it's not the weakest it's just kind of middle of the road and again for these you're going to eventually tear them up because you're going to want to scrap them in order to get use the parts that you get from it to research some of the free primes so there's certain primes that take uh four star refined materials and by creating and scrapping these ships you can get some of those materials uh, in order to buy those primes. And if you scrap any two of these three, I think that is enough to buy all of the, what they call kind of the free primes or the ones that you don't need to buy. Uh, so it's something you're eventually going to level up and scrap just for the utility. But as you're leveling up, you're probably not going to take these beyond tier four, five, six at the most before you're on to that next ship level anyway. Now, the next ones here are kind of the decorative uh, sort of ships. There is the Separatist D3. So this is pretty much identical to the D3 itself, but it's red. <laughs> and one of the main thing, like good things about the D3 is that you can scrap it later. But with the Separatist one and with the next three, which are the hijacked ones, the Separatist one at least looks cool. The three hijacked ones just kind of look, they're not that cool looking in the first place. Um, you can get them and build them, but any materials you put into them is lost because they don't have a scrap route. They can't be turned back in. Whereas at least what you invest in these ones, you can. So functionally, they're basically the same thing, but the fact that you can't get the resources back out of them and you're gonna have to put a lot of resources into them, it may be something you get later in the game just as a collectible, but it's not something you want to be building as you're leveling up because it's just gonna be a resource sink that you don't get anything back uh, for that investment in. So I'm going to put the Separatist one in D because it, at least it's cooler and redder. These ones are just kind of gray and I don't know, something. Uh, and they do, they're they just not that cool uh, to me. And the fact that they killed the utility of these three things uh, just kind of wrecks them. The next up is the Stella. Stella, I'm going to have to put in the A because it does give you access to the whole, a whole bunch of the nodes in the outlaw tree. So Stella is used for the Eclipse Hostels and the Eclipse Armadas, and it is really the only thing that you want to be using on those because you get a big loot bonus uh, for using this ship compared to anything else. Uh, and it's many times, I think you can get up to like 800% more once you've done research and uh, leveled the ship up. It's also got a intentional scrapping loop to it. So the idea is that you level the ship up and when it's at a certain tier, you scrap it and you get these particles that are used in that research tree. Then you re-level up the ship and scrap it again and re-level up the ship and scrap it again. And in the process of doing that, you add what uh, I think they call them M levels 
uh, that there's 160, I think, researchers for the Stella. And so you're going to level it up uh, and it's going to get stronger each iteration. This is one of the few ships where it's really recommended that you get more than one because then you can max one out. You can then use your second one to constantly be scrapping it uh, at different levels and you're not going to have to remax your original actual fighting Stella, basically. Um, so yeah, it's really good at what it does. It's a fairly decent little um, battleship as well. Um, even in like light PVP, it's not too bad once you stick like strike team uh, and isolic officers on it. It fires a lot of shots. The firing pattern is really good. Uh, so it can be fairly decent at that, but it really has utility and, you know, there's weekly events and everything based on this that can get you materials, get you faction credits, get you officers, everything like that. So it's definitely a good cycle to be in. And then on top of that, it's got the whole uh, research tree, which is a pretty big tree uh, that has a lot of utility in it, including efficiencies uh, for materials and things like that and a lot of combat and uh, PvP stuff. So that's definitely a ship that is up there and it's one that you're going to, you know, start using in your 20s and you're going to still be using that thing uh, in your 50s, 60s, uh, all the way up to 70 pretty much. Uh, it's still going to have some value. So the next tier of faction ship up, we've got the uh, Bordis. Um, that one I'm going to probably put, I'm probably going to say the Bordis is in the C category here as well. I just don't think it's best of class. I, I think actually out of these three, I think it's worst of class. Um, so again, it's the Klingon one. It's a battleship, which is a bit slower. I always kind of hate using a battleship as my hostile grinder because just the impulse speed is a bit lower. It's just a little bit more annoying. It can be tankier sometimes and maybe survive more um, to get more kills, but just slower to move around and, and everything and doesn't come with some of the uh, perks that a couple of the other ones do. I'll talk about the Centurion next. This is the one I actually went in my first uh, playthrough of the game. Um, I've got two accounts now, but in the first one I went with the Centurion. This one, you can get a cloak for it that can be useful um, to do dailies on, on cloaks and stuff. But in terms of uh, it's not the strongest ship, again, it can do things like kill some swarm for you where the Franklin still kind of sucks, uh, but it's not the strongest one. I think people have generally agreed that the strongest ship here is going to be the Saladin. And I'm going to stick that into uh, the B category uh, here as well. It's got um, one gun on it that is very strong that fires in the first round. So basically the Saladin seems to be better at just shutting, shutting fights down a lot quicker uh, than the other two. So even though the Bordis may be a little bit tankier, the fact that the Saladin, Saladin has just a big gun that can end fights a lot quicker uh, seems to make it actually the most survivable anyway. But I think all three of these ships, uh, they're the level 28 faction ships. You can really ride these ships well into the mid to late 30s until you replace it with the Epic. And I think these are the first ones that you're probably going to spend a lot of resources on actually tearing up. And you're going to do that in order to skip the level 30 ships uh, that we'll talk about in a bit. Um, because they do have the legs to kind of get you really to the late 30s if you want it, uh, but at least until you end up with uh, the epic ships to replace it. The cube here is a really interesting one. Um, the cube, when you get it, and for the foreseeable future after that, is not a good ship. It's always going to be behind where your faction ships are, almost by design, because they fact that you have to tear up your faction ship in order to be able to unlock the next tier of the board cube is going to make it relatively weak. I think particularly the way that they sold this ship and the refiner like the refinery and the cutting beam loop that comes with it, I'm going to put it in a D. I found it really disappointing because they made it sound like it was going to be a very strong ship that you could use for a lot of things. It's really not if you're someone sitting in your mid 
30s or 40s, you're probably going to have the cube be like your sixth or seventh best ship. It's not even going to make it into your solo armadas. The fact that it's not a faction ship means that it doesn't get a lot of the bonuses that a lot of things get. And it also has no specific bonus of its own. So where other things like the Vidar, the Talios, the Mantis, the whatever, are going to have some bonus against a specific type of hostile, the cube doesn't. It's just kind of generic. Uh, so it's not going to have an advantage on anything against anything else. The caveats to that, though, are it does appear to get much, much better as you get into 60 plus. So even at 59 now, it's still, it's maybe my like fourth best ship. But as you get above that, it will start to become like your second best. And it can become a hostile grinder that is not uh, using the six star resources to repair and stuff. Um, so I think that's going to be something that is potentially good in the late, late game. But I feel that for most people, that's not really relevant and it's not going to be relevant for a long time. So I think if you're just a player kind of where most of the population is in your 30s and 40s, uh, it's not the best ship in the world. It's just kind of a nuisance uh, as you have to do that cutting beam grind throughout. But it's also just something you can have. It's a cool looking ship. It's kind of fun um, using the, the cutting beam to like kill someone in PVP is kind of fun, um, things like that, but it's not a good utility. Um, I, I also think I give it some credit for the tech tree that's associated with it, but even then, to be honest, while I want the things in the tech tree, they're very <clears throat> not creative and they're not earth shattering. It's just all the standard things like add a little more to your hull and shields, add a little more to your accuracy, add a little more to your defense, add a little more to the weapon power. Like it's, it's very, very generic uh, stuff that you get in that. So obviously you want it, but uh, there's also no free path to this. So if you didn't get it uh, when it first came out in the, in the event store that uh, followed it, um, then you probably don't have it. But it's not that crucial, and it does strike me as something. One kind of good thing about it is if you don't end up getting it in your low levels, you can get it later and just catch up relatively quickly, and it's not like you're missing out on something. It doesn't have like a refinery pull where you're getting officer shards or something really valuable. You're really only getting things to then tech up that tree. So if you get it later, you get it later. It's not that crucial. Um, and so I'm going to stick that one in a D. If I include the way that they marketed it as if it was going to be amazing, then I would put it in an F, but it's a utility ship. I, I'll say one thing that's good and I'll kind of get into why this is good later. The fact that it is a battleship is actually kind of good simply because a lot of the faction ships later, you don't want the battleship. So the fact that they've given you a battleship kind of on the side that could fill in when you need one is good because you're generally not going to build battleships later on uh, just because of the way impulse speed works, the way the PVP meta works, uh, and so on. They don't tend to be the best choice, but uh, I'll talk about that as I get towards those. Another battleship that very little utility and i'm gonna uh, i'm gonna throw this in an f um used to be a little more valuable is the sarco and i feel like at the time it came out it probably had some value in territory uh holding capture nodes is clearly what it's for if it's not on a capture node it might as well be a piece of paper mache floating through space it has no strength whatsoever but if it is attacking or is sitting on a node then it's a lot stronger and it does fire all of its weapons around one so when it was in its heyday it actually could sit on a node and then a, another ship would come by, try to attack it, and you would just obliterate that ship in round one. Now that's kind of how PvP works anyway, um, that you there's so much isolytic damage that the fights are very short. But also other ships have outpaced it so much uh, that it's just kind of irrelevant. It's around the level of like the 34 epic ships, but if somebody came in with bigger stuff, uh, four star ships, five star ships, a Sarko, even in the hands of a really, really big player is not going to do anything at all. Um, 
and the fact that it's just so vulnerable whenever it's not on a node. People just people still try and use them in the territory stuff, uh, but as it's flying in the system, literally you could come up with like a two star ship and probably kill it um, if it's not on a node. So if you intercept it before it gets to the place it wants to be, uh, then it's just gonna be useless. The other thing that really gets to me on this one is that it actually takes three and four star parts and three and four star materials. If this only took specialty materials, uh, which it does have a refinery that gives you parts to repair it and, and build with it and stuff, if it only took those, then I'd say, okay, go ahead and get it. It's a super utility ship that you're never really gonna use that much. Uh, but you know, in your 30s, 40s, you might use it a tiny bit. Um, and it's not costing you anything. The problem is it does cost you a lot to actually level this thing up to the level that it needs to be. It does take a lot of resources that are just simply better spent elsewhere. So it's one of those things that I, it's probably the first one in these that I just say, literally do not build it. You would be better off if you don't have this ship. Um, so yeah, if, if you just kind of want to get it, and I know you get it for free kind of from the uh, cosmic cleanup anyway, and eventually you run out of things to buy regardless, so it's like you might as well. But if you do get it, I would definitely say don't tear it up until you've hit a point that you just absolutely don't need these resources anymore. They've added into the new territory tree even more like a power up to this, but even with that maxed out, it's still nowhere near uh, powerful enough for what you need. So again, I would just say this one's an F, skip it. It's literally a negative to you uh, to level it up because you're wasting resources that you could uh, be using for something else. Next, and I'll group these together because they're relatively uh, the same thing. They're just for the different resources, but we've got the Cavort and we've got the other faction miners. I'm gonna put these into a B and they might end up being the highest uh, uh, ranked like survey ships. So they're relatively relatively cheap to get in that you can just kind of start pulling these from your armada packs. Uh, so they will come out of armada packs in terms of the BPs that you get. I would not recommend actually spending frac faction credits to get them. Uh, you're better off just kind of sticking with the, uh, with the horizon for that. Um, but they are decent. They're decent at doing the role of mining the resource that they're devoted to be doing. They're not really that much faster though, to be honest, than the Horizon. But one of the main benefits of them is that they then scrap for the next tier up of stuff. Um, that you can basically, I think you can turn a small profit basically by having maxed out efficiency, dumping it into these and then scrapping them, you could actually potentially end up with more uh, of the materials from them. They also used to be a lot better. I used to use these as a cheap thing uh, that you would have excess blueprints from or that you could buy relatively cheaply. You can build one of these for like 15,000 credits. You could actually in leaderboard events, tier them up and just scrap them purely for the points on the leader, leaderboard when you're a 40 or 50 player, uh, and you could just kind of spend the resources on them. However, now they cut the points that you get from that so much that it's not really worth your time, effort, and faction credits to do that. So it does knock them down a bit, but they were good as scrap fodder uh, before that. But yeah, these are something that you're gonna be potentially getting in your 30s, you're still going to be using these well into your 40s, uh, most likely. And it's something that you're just going to kind of acquire. So I wouldn't spend on them. But are they good ships? Yeah, I think they're still pretty good ships. Um, and you're going to be using them probably for a pretty long time, uh, which I think uh, warrants the B there. The amalgam here is utility but it's the only thing that can be used for that utility. So the amalgam is used for base rating and basically base rating only um, in terms of its actual, I guess, prescription use uh, for it. So it gives you a bonus so that when you're rating a base, it takes a percentage of what that person has in, uh, 
in reserve and dumps it into the ship, even if that exceeds the cargo of the ship. So if you hit someone with a trillion resources, you can be pulling uh, a couple billion off them because of the ability on the ship. There's officers like Bator that increase that ability, and now a fleet commander Sloan that further increases that ability, as well as a refit on the ship that, again, further increases it. This is super useful, obviously, for incursions, where that's the main metric for how your server is judged. And if you do need to just plan get some resources, then that's the way to go. This also then has the refinery attached to it, which is the main source of getting Honor Guard Wharf. And given that Honor Guard Wharf himself has become really, really important to the PvP meta again, he kind of went out of fashion and then has now come back, um, you know, three years apart, I guess, from when he first came out. But he's really, really important again. So this ship can give you the shards for that. Uh, it also gives you access to a couple other uh, things, including um, beam weapons and some skins for other ships. But one of the things that you can get eventually from the refinery is the cloaking shards for the amalgam itself. Now that, I think they originally envisioned it as, oh, you can use this to cloak in and raid someone's base. That doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, and I've never really seen anyone bother to do that. But where it is super useful is once you've leveled up your tech on stealth a fair bit and you've got Baytor uh, on the ship as well, you can actually get the amalgam's cloaking time to over 30 minutes. And I think by default, it's still in the teens, even if you've got none of that. So it's actually really useful in territories uh, fights because say that you've got six ships out, you can cloak an amalgam or two amalgams, just send them into the system, sit there and get points for you. And you don't need to worry about them for 15, 20, 30 minutes. And they're just collecting free points while you focus on your other ships and combat and repairing and sending back and stuff. So it's actually really good for that niche purpose as well. Uh, but it's obviously the best and really only ship uh, that you can use for rating. So I think it has to go into the A uh, there. And again, it's going to be a ship that once you get it, you're going to be using it for years. And it's one of the few ships that you'll occasionally say, should I get a second one? And I would say, yeah, if you've got the credits to do it in an event store or something comes up, yeah, it's probably worth getting a second one. It's easy to tear up once you do. Um, so yeah, I, I'd say that's one of the few that kind of makes that that level. Now, the next three here are a little bit more victims of their placement in the line. The 28 faction ships are really good. And then the 34 epic ships are super, super good. So it kind of just comes down to the cost for what you're getting. These aren't actually bad ships, but I'm going to say the Brel, Intrepid, and Gladius go in CCD. Um... The Brel is decent. The Gladius is decent. If I was going to get one of these three, I'd probably go for the Gladius. Again, interceptor, relatively quick. It's got a decent firing pattern on it. The Intrepid is terrible. <laughs> um, it's got a really bad firing pattern. It takes to round three to really hit its strong weapons. Uh, and the fact that it's a battleship and it's a bit slower. And it's on the Federation line. I'm actually going to drop this to an F. The fact that it would take Federation credits to get it, the fact that it has a really bad firing pattern, and the fact that it's uh, quite a bit slower, uh, I think it is in the literally just don't build this because it's going to get in the way of the direction that you're probably going in at those levels. It's not a necessary ship. Your 28 ships can really just cause you to skip this entire bracket and just go to the epic level. Um, so it's just going to suck your resources away. It's going to suck your faction credits away. And particularly because this is Federation, you need those faction credits to be leveling officers as well. The most officers that are in the game unfortunately take federation credits it used to be more balanced but of course every new officer that comes out is usually someone from like ds9 and their federation or archer and they're from the enterprise and their federation even though the federation didn't exist then um 
you know, they take Federation credit. So I think you end up needing, I think it's three to four times as many Federation credits for officers than you do for Klingon and uh, Romulan in the game. So the fact that you would, on a needless level, buy a Intrepid using faction credits, probably not what you want to be doing. So unless you somehow got this ship for like free, it's again, goes in the category of detrimental to you to even bother to build this thing. Uh, and I would just skip it. You also then in our next thing coming up, and we talked about how the, the cube kind of acts as a fill in battleship. The Mantis is kind of in that role as well. And I'm going to put the Mantis in the B category. One is it's good at killing the Actians, although eventually you're going to not use it to kill the Actians and you'll actually use a better ship of your own uh, equipped with a burning crew to be able to do that. But the refinery attached to the Mantis is really good. Uh, and that's kind of the super important thing for it. So it can be a decent battleship if you just kind of need one in order to complete events or something. If it's like, you know, go out and get 50 kills of the battleship, then that'll do or the cube will do. And you don't need like a normal faction one. But what's really the payoff here is that you can get the syndicate XP from the mantis tree and you can or not tree but refinery and you can also get the S and W shards from the mantis uh, refinery and those are both really really uh, powerful things so the normal daily drip from your syndicate depending on what your level is is 250 300 I think up to 750 a day uh, and then maybe another I forget what it is. 100 or 500 from the the daily credits that you get for completing your dailies but i get currently with a max mantis 7500 uh syndicate xp daily from just turning the actian venom to the syndicate so it's literally multiplying the speed that you're getting that stuff by like eight um and given how important some of those syndicate levels are and how long it takes to get through some of them that's really really valuable and the refinery that is attached that you can get the S and W officer shards from is also quite good. So some of those, particularly once you get a bit higher, are super useful. S and W Spock, Ortegas, Pike, uh, Hammer, uh, whatever, uh, Ahura. Um, and they come relatively quickly. The epic ones will take a little longer, but those rare officers, there's a lot of lucky pulls and they come kind of quicker than you would think that they would uh, compared to some of the other refineries in the game. You'll often get uh, multiple shards from it. Uh, then on top of that, the Actian, uh, the uh, Sting, the Mantis Sting against opponents in PvP, in uh, you know territory fights, whatever, is really super valuable. Uh, you can be... And it, it's also something that you may not be one of the biggest players out there, but you can help your team basically by getting a Mantis out and start to sting the big guys from the other team and soften them up for your your big players, your big hitters. And when somebody is stung, you very often can punch up against them quite a bit. So it is uh, a really valuable thing as a utility ship uh, in PvP as well. So I think that warrants a B. The thing is that it's the type of thing that... Once you get to a certain point, you're never going to actually use the Mantis to hit a hostile. Uh, and you're never going to actually use the Mantis to hit another player or anything. You're just going to take it out of dock, hit Sting, and then probably redock it again. Um, and then just use the refinery. You're going to use other ships to kill the Actians eventually uh, using the burning crews. And you're just never going to actually use this thing. But it still has that utility uh, that's attached to it, uh, really. The D4, so now we're getting into the epics. These are really good to begin with. Um, so I'm probably not going to put any of these low. I'm going to say that the D4 is probably into a B territory. Um, so it's pretty good. It's synergetic with what is the best PvP uh, crews out there now, which tend to be the interceptors. It works well with hull breach. Its special ability is designed to work with hull breach, but it doesn't really have uh, a lot of oomph to it. It increases, uh, I think the ability is 25% extra damage if they've got hull breach. 25% these days is not a lot. It's 
I mean, it's probably less than 1% in reality, um, given the other resource and power creep that's uh, happened over time, but it's still there, it's still valuable. I'm gonna put probably the D4 there. The auger has suffered a little bit. When I was coming up, it was probably the strongest PVP one. I think it's uh, probably the worst of the three now. PVP wise, burning isn't that great. Battleships aren't that great. They don't have the best uh, team to it, but it is still a really strong ship. It's a really tanky ship. It's good for armadas. It's good for hostile grinding. Uh, it's good for a number of things. And again, it can kind of be a staple battleship that can carry you for a while. But if I was to build uh, these three epics, that would probably be three out of three for me. It would be the last one uh, that I would focus on. And then the Enterprise is gonna be the first thing that I throw into the S tier. And the reason for this is because if anything, while the ship ability of the D4 and Augur have trailed off as the rest of the game has gotten more advanced, the natural shield regeneration of the Enterprise has actually gotten more and more valuable as it goes. Because it is a percentage of the shield itself and requires morale to trigger, that is going to happen a lot of time in PvE. It's going to be applicable in Armadas and it's going to be applicable with the current PvP meta. So in all of these cases, the fact that your shield stays up so drastically outweighs the benefit you get from extra damage done by the D4 and Augur uh, from having their activated abilities. The fact that the shield is eternal basically simply by having a morale officer and there are so many viable morale officers that you could have on, whether it's Wayun in PvP, whether it's Kirk in PvE, they don't even have to be the captain. Nowadays, you can also trigger it from below decks because of Harry Kim. The fact that the shield can permanently stay on and just be immortal basically because it's a big enough percentage in most cases makes this super, super valuable. Uh, if you're trying to fight things like Q trials, you're trying to punch up, you're trying to do armadas, whatever, the fact that the shield is going to stay up without requiring a big commitment from you of totally altering your crew to something it shouldn't be uh, is going to be hugely uh, advantageous, whereas something like the auger trying to put on an armada crew that's going to also trigger burning or something is counter to what you're probably naturally going to do, whereas there are a number of armada crews that do naturally use uh, morale for it. So it's just a much better ship. If you were going, if you're approaching this and you're trying to make a decision on these three, I think it's over time become more and more of a no brainer that the enterprise is absolutely the way to go. I think the game pushes you in that direction anyway, just in terms of missions and kind of how everything shapes itself out. Um, that if you just kind of follow what it tells you, you're going to end, end up with uh, Federation as kind of one of your highest with a lot of credits. So I would uh, probably go that way anyway, but it's definitely the first S tier ship and you can do so many things with it, exploiting that shield mechanic that just the other ships, they're just tin cans. This is a tin can with a shield around it, basically a permanent shield. And, uh, and that's just great. So definitely the first tier S. The next one coming up, and I'm going to put this in the A category, is going to be the Voyager. And the thing that makes this one so good, one, it has special, it has several special utilities to it. So one is it's good at fighting the Herogen and 8472. It's the only thing that can really get out there and and do those combats effectively. There's a refinery loop attached to it. There's a tech tree attached to it. It also then is doubling as a miner of the anomalies in the uh, systems. And it has special abilities that uncloak things. And also, while I've never actually used it, it's got an ability that lets you click on someone and find out where your, their base is. So if someone's really annoying, then that can be uh, useful as well uh, to find their base and try and hunt them down. But the tech tree in this is quite good. There's a lot of things in there that relate to the artifacts. Um, and just improve combat for your other ships, not just Voyager itself. It improves Armada combat, uh, faction ship combat, um, a lot of other things, repair efficiency, 
um, and so on. So definitely, I think Voyager is really good for what it was intended for. It's also super, super good for simply reaching large warp ranges. So by level 40 something, I think maybe 42, you can start reaching with your Voyager five star armadas, which is huge. So if you've got people in your alliance that can help you kill those, just being able to reach that area and start those armadas and then be able to claim the starter's chest for killing them, even though the other people there are going to overwhelm you with power and take most of the credits, getting that starter chest is often going to be a lot more than you would get for doing three and four star armadas. So just having the access to that to get to that space um, it's going to allow you to do missions more. It's, it just opens up the whole lot to now have a ship that is like in the 200 plus warp category when usually you wouldn't have that as a player until you're like in your 50s. Uh, so suddenly it's made that accessible to players in their low 40s uh, to have a ship that can get out there. And that's just super, super helpful. And it's not a bad hostile grinder. You can use, again, that warp range to reach places that you usually couldn't. And as long as you've got a good enough crew, uh, you can be taking out targets that you usually wouldn't be able to uh, with your faction ships and, and just get access to things, missions, whatever, uh, that you didn't have access to before. So I think that one is a strong A. The USS Franklin A is going to go in, nah, that's generous. You're still going in the C because um, while it's better, it's now kind of the only way to efficiently kill swarms. So while I felt the Franklin itself just wasn't ever even good at what it was designed to do, the Franklin A is ultimately the, the best way to kill higher level swarms as you get into the uh, high 30s and 40s, 50 ones. Um, but there's simply less call for that now anyway. The freebooters have come along and eliminated the need to do swarms daily. So it's really now only the weekly swarm hunt that you need to go out and kill with. But now the Franklin A does serve that purpose fairly well, whereas the Franklin, I think, did not uh, actually do that very well. So Franklin A, at least good for that. But there's no real associated refinery tech anything you could just you could just go the whole game now and ignore the franklin completely and you wouldn't be that worse for wear you'd be short on some con shards and some four star resources once a week but that's about it it's not that crucial but it's a ship that just is there if you do that weekly con is still pretty good he's worth getting and if they're offering you a free uh, depending on your level, 5, 10, 13 shards a week, uh, you might as well do that. He's one of the officers, epic officers, that you could actually max out relatively, I say relatively quickly, still like two years uh, to max him out, but it is something uh, that you can do um, by using the Franklin, but it's just not crucial these days. It used to be, but ever since the freebooters, it's just not something you have to deal with daily. It's more of an optional thing now. So I'm still going to put that in a C. The Devor Fisha is debatable on one big, big, big thing. It's whether or not you feel like buying the Ferengi whip. So if you're a free to play player, then I would say the Devor Fisha is maybe you know, chilling as a, as a, well, probably still a B. Uh, but if you throw the whip on it, then you're suddenly mining at an exponentially faster rate, like a hundred times faster from that. And the whip itself comes with the refinery that helps you level up other forbidden tech stuff and, and your queue building and things like that. Uh, but that's not, you know, the ship itself. It's just having that, that whip. So it's really down to if you're willing to spend 50 bucks, then this ship becomes super, super valuable. If you're not willing to do that, then it's still good. And it still gives you access to latinum and stuff. But the things that make the fisher really good, and it's not just the whip, there's a refit for it as well. The scavenger refit, I believe it's called, that gives you access to 
uh, more ship parts, which are super important in the four star thing. So it's kind of a ship that by itself, it's going to give you latinum and that's good. But if you're willing to put money into it, then you get things that are actually quite a bit more valuable. But that's obviously not something that uh, everyone's going to want to do. Um, just to to get those benefits out of it so it's a long-term play i think it's in the b category of specialty minor ship but at least has the utility there of what you get out of it and that thing being the latinum as you level up and up, uh, higher and higher if you don't have those refits and add-ons to it it's not as valuable but certainly for your like 30s low 40s that latinum income of thousands a day is definitely uh helpful in terms of your speed ups and, and things like that the defiant here uh, is a little disappointing as a ship unfortunately um it has its niche role so the defiant is good kind of early on to help you with the gem hadar armadas but i feel like it's not really a help it's just a thing that you're you're kind of persuaded to put in uh, because it gives you more loot from them. So when you use the Defiant as part of your armada itself, it gives you more of the edicts from the Jem'Hadar armadas. And if you don't do that, then you're going to be missing out on those edicts, which you can then use to open other chests that give you more officer shards and ship parts and, and things like that and other armada starts. So it kind of coerces you to use it. But unlike some other things like the Talios with the Borg ones, the Defiant isn't actually that good at fighting the things. They, it has theoretically a bonus um, to killing it, but not really. And like eventually your faction ships are going to be way stronger than the Defiant is. Like even a maxed out Defiant is not that strong. Like it's definitely like if you just ranked it against your ships, it's going to be like 12th or something. So it's more something that it's like the little brother that wants to tag along and then you have to let it play in order for it to give you extra loot from it but it's not beneficial it's not actually a good fighter uh in the thing and even with killing the gem hadar itself the hostels which i think is what it was designed to do a bit it's not even really like that good at that um and it takes a while to tear up like it's a long grind uh to get it to the appropriate tier and so on so i just don't think it's a great one uh but i will say the actual buff that it gives can eventually be really, really good. So the tech tree associated with this, which is the active defiant buff, can make you very, very strong against Armadas. It does pretty big buffs, like increasing your critical hit chances by, I want to say like 25%, your critical hit damage by a lot, your piercing mitigation, a whole bunch of things by quite a large amount. It's not the piddly stuff of like this increases 20%, it's like 350%. It's like it adds up to a to a fair bit. It's a noticeable difference, especially when you stack it with things like the Cerritos and Titan and stuff. It can basically make it so that in Armada was you were barely scratching it and now you're just completely killing it by loading on those buffs. So it's good in that sense, but you're not going to use the actual ship that much and it could have been so much cooler. I just think the way that they designed it, uh, it didn't. Uh, it just wasn't. And they never made it quite strong enough that the level that you're going to be at at the time you're using it against the target, it's just not It's not really what you want to use. You're just going to be like coerced to bringing it as your third ship. It's not really good at it. So um, I think that's a, a strike against it. So we'll put it in a C. Now, the Talios... I think does get into the A category. This is one that is a good, so it's clearly meant to kill the probes, uh, the higher level probes, which you do need to be doing fairly frequently. There is a refinery associated with it, which is pretty valuable. Uh, same as the Vidar is associated with faction credits, faction, uh, uh, faction rep, uh, although I do that one less often, um, things like that, again, charge nanoprobes, et cetera, et cetera, uh, in order to help tear the ship up. It's also one that seems to get like exponentially stronger. So it starts off relatively weak. Uh, I'd say at tier two, 
uh, it's about the same as your maxed out uh, Vidar. Uh, but then it almost like doubles in power for each tier until you eventually get it as like a few hundred million power ship or a couple hundred million power ship uh, as the hull just gets bigger, shields get bigger, everything gets stronger and, uh, and beefier. Um, it's got a pretty good warp range on it. You could definitely use it as a hostile grinder. It's a really good OPC fighter. It's got good warp range, um, all that stuff. It's really good against the solo armadas uh, meant for the Borg, uh, as it does get a bigger weapon damage against those. It's also got buffs that you get from killing those uh, solo armadas to be able to increase the loot that you get. So it really, really cuts down that Borg a probe grinding thing you can basically turn on one of those plus 400 percent loots for 15 minutes go into the borg system kill like 20 things and walk out with 10 million probes um so it gets really big it just saves you a lot of time and it has some use outside of its intended purpose um it's decent in PvP, but the firing pattern is really bad for it. So it only fires one weapon in the first round, two weapons in the second round, and then three weapons in the third round. So it takes a while to ramp up. So often in PvP, given all the isolytic front loading now that everything does, it's probably not going to make it to that third round where it gets strong, but it's still not terrible. It, it just doesn't quite do the power that it's supposed to do. It's going to lose to f some faction ships, but if you've got like 100 million Talios, it's definitely going to you know, kill some people and, and, and do some stuff, and it's a decent hostile grinder. So I think it still goes in an A. It just doesn't quite get to like an S or anything, but I think for all its utility added up together, I, I'd have to put it there. It is a ship that you will use for quite a while. You get it at like 35. You will still be using this in your 50s uh, and probably 60s uh, to still be doing those, those grinds. Uh, it still gets you a lot of stuff that's worth it. The Cerritos is another ship that it's good, but it's only good because of the ability that it does. So it comes with the refinery that gets you access to some uh, of the lower deck officers, um, but it's like a slow trickle that you will not notice much, uh, but you'll eventually get them over time. But it's really the active ability to buff that is uh, really useful. That's gonna be useful for armadas, it's gonna be useful for Q trials, it's useful in PVP, territory defense, things like that. But the ship itself might as well like stay in the box. Like you're never gonna fight anyone with the ship. You're never gonna use the ship. It's literally a support ship. And it's, I'd say probably, it and maybe the discovery are like the pure support literally are not meant to enter combat. Although at least the discovery, they make you fight something, uh, you know, once a week or something, although you could just jump around and avoid it. But the Cerritos, you will, if you never fight a hostile with it, you're doing it right. Um, you, it's just there to support the other things. So I think it falls in that C category. It's one that you're going to want to get, but you don't need to rush it. And, yeah, and it's more based on the tech tree and that ability. Using the ship itself is never going to be anything. It also takes a long time to tear up. There's the weekly events to get the parts. Uh, now that is a lot better, though, because of the Voyager, which I don't think I mentioned the Voyager refinery, also including the ship parts for specialty ships. But that makes it so much easier to tear up the Cerritos, to tear up your... Uh, your fecha to tear up your amalgam, things like that. It gives extra parts for the Cerritos used to take forever uh, to tear up. And now you can do that a lot quicker. Um, so that at least is beneficial, but as a ship itself, it's not there, but that ability certainly is a valuable ability uh, to have the Titan. Titan should be, I, I don't quite want to put it in a D, but I'm going to put it in a D. <laughs> Uh, the ability that it has can be crucial for very, very niche things. So there are some, eventually you will hit a point in Q trials where unless you Cerritos buff and fortify and max fortify your ship, you cannot advance further in the Q's trials. However, that is essentially the only, only thing. Um, you may use the fortify 
like before the start of a territory takeover to kind of buff people. You may use it, you know, doing armadas if you really need everyone to be buffed a bit. But it's not usually like how often is that the case? Um, less so, I think, than the Cerritos. The way that it works too, while it does buff multiple people, which is nice, you just literally are never going to use this ship. Like I take it out once a day to hit fortify to do the daily to get the parts and stuff uh, from my daily task and then put it away. And I don't even care if I hit a ship. It just you need to click the ability. Um, so yeah, outside Q's trials, I never legitimately use it. And because the max fortify takes several days worth of the collection of uh, juice for it, the, I forget what it starts with, the D, Dionetic or whatever it is, juice, deuterium. Um, yeah, deuterium juice, I think it is. It takes, basically you have to like wait a week until you have enough juice to fortify a max fortify. And then you can get one shot at the Q hostel you're trying to kill. And then that's it for a week. You either succeed or you don't. And then you're kind of done. And then next week you can try again. Whereas at least with the Cerritos and at least with the Defiant, you can use it multiple times. So if people are out, um, you know, doing a bunch of Ramadas that day, you could probably use it like five or 10 times and you've probably got the juice for it. And then there's the weekly event where you're supposed to do it multiple times to go hostels, things like that. So, but the Titan, I find you don't really use it daily and you wouldn't really bring it out and use it multiple times in a row. It's very, very niche. And um, yeah, the ship just kind of sucks and it, it turned out to be very lackluster. Uh, the jellyfish is an interesting one. It used to be more valuable than it is now. Uh, and I think the Voyager has kind of displaced it a little bit. It used to be that as you were entering the 40s and you were entering deep space for the first time, your 34 epic ships weren't really able to get very far into the warp range. So the jellyfish, which is very specifically a hostile grinding ship, it has abilities that increase weapon damage the longer you're fighting a hostile, and it has a relatively long warp range, was meant to be your kind of transition grinder between 39 and 42 before you got into those four star faction ships. Uh, but because Voyager has the warp range now, I feel there's less need for the jellyfish. However, there is still some uses for it. One is that there is a monthly event um, where you kill with the jellyfish. I think jellyfish pursuit or jellyfish hunt uh, and you have to go kill 50 hostels and it gives you a lot of explorer ship parts um, kind of a pretty good amount especially for your low 40s which can help you get started when you get into that 42 faction ship range um, so that's definitely helpful the other thing that in the long run it's really really good for it's one of the only ships I think possibly the only one where you can Build it using four-star parts and materials. And if your efficiency levels are high enough, you can build it and max it out, scrap it, and actually get more parts of the exact same type than you spent on it. So it's hard to, and you'll see if you're in the 40s, you're there already. If you're not, you'll see when you get there. It's hard to get the ship parts, especially rare parts, uh, for the four star ships. Um, so you can get a jellyfish up to say tier eight or nine where you start to need to use those rare parts, scrap it at that, make another jellyfish and actually use the old parts to then get it to tier 10 and scrap it again. And now you can get it to tier 11. It's almost similar to what you would do with the Stella uh, where you scrap it multiple times, but of course you're limited by whether you not whether or not you have the jellyfish parts to be able to do that. Once you get to the point that you're routinely able to actually max it out, um, then you can actually now be scrapping it, putting some of the extra parts into something like a Valdor until you can scrap that at max level, and then that will give you now five star parts that you can then use. Um, 
on your five star ships. So it creates this virtuous cycle that as you scrap jellyfish, you're actually making a profit from doing it and you can use it to tear up the next one and still have an excess left over. That becomes really popular in the five star game, uh, but it is probably not something you're going to do. Well, I think you need to be I think it's level 55 to scrap it anyway, so don't worry about it till then, but it's something that you do in the long run want, and anything that you do invest into the jellyfish, you will eventually get back uh, as you do later in the game. Hit that. It may be, you know, two years later uh, that that happens, but you will eventually uh, get it back. So I think it still is good in the B category. There's specific events for it. It's still a good hostile grinder, but... Voyager has usurped it a little bit. If Voyager didn't exist, this might be in the A category, but it is, uh, it's probably not there anymore. The Monavine, one, one note thing. Um, so as a ship, you're only going to use it to fight the Texas class and the Texas class armadas or whatever they're called. Um, and it just auto grinds if you want. So you can literally just send the ship there. Sentries will come and hit it. You don't have to manually do anything. Or you can go out and hunt things manually and you'll get more of one of the one of the parts than the other or whatever. But it's a very low maintenance thing that you don't need to spend a lot of time or attention on. But also the Monavine is not going to be much use outside of that. Where the Monavine becomes really, really good is its refinery and its tech tree. So the refinery itself gives you extra materials uh, starting in the four-star uh, area. And in the five-star area, it becomes extremely crucial for the RSS, the par steel, the tritanium, and the dilithium. It gives you that throughout, but that becomes a super bottleneck in the five-star economy that you never have enough par steel, you never have enough dilithium to do your research, you never have enough tritanium to level up your ships properly. So it suddenly gives a refinery that gives huge amounts of those. I would say at level, I just went from level 58 to 59 this past weekend, and I would say now probably 85% of my par steel, tritanium, and dilithium come from the Monavine. So you used to have to get it from the daily events that would give you, you know, here's 30 billion tritanium or here's 10 billion dilithium or whatever it is. Um, I can now daily get from the Monavine 500 billion par steel, uh, 77 billion tritanium, and 10 billion dilithium and then of course you can choose to do double pulls on about one of those a day so you can do single single double on whichever one you need each day so it's now the main provider of all the rss um so it's super important to to kind of get relatively early and level up it's not going to seem that crucial to you probably in the 40s as you get to the late 40s and early 50s you're going to start to see how this is like the most valuable refinery that you have also in the tech tree associated with it there's some really good pvp stuff increases your isolytic damage against uh, players increases your critical hit damage against players increases isolytic against those texas class things warp range etc also uh, has a section to increase the rewards that you get from armadas uncommon rare and epic armadas increases the uh, return from that and also faction reputation as well uh, there is a bonus in that tech tree monavine is a really good tech tree uh, it's probably one of the best in a while in terms of the density of how good some of those researches uh, really are and they play into i think it's got station attack and some other things in there too so whether it's pvp pve armadas whatever it, it's kind of got something for everyone in that and again the refinery just really really good so monavine and you can get it if you've got the territories like if your alliance has territories you can get it free to play through both two and three star territories now only some about half, i think it's 12 of the 20 two star territories have it um and it would take about three months to get if you have access to those um so that's an option i hope they add some other path to that or it becomes available in the event store because it's 200 bps and i know a lot of people don't have it my alliance just did uh get a three star 
this uh, this past session. And so a few people are now completing it that had bought half of it in the event store. It's a really, really good, uh, again, not a good ship. It's a really good refinery. It's a really good tech tree. And it's a weird ship that you just leave out. You can literally just leave it out overnight and like close the game and you're and it will collect resources for you. So it's a, it's a weird one for that, but it's definitely important to have. But it won't seem like it's super valuable when you get it, but it will be valuable months later. You'll start to see the value of, of that. The NX1 is shit. Uh, <laughs> uh, maybe not an F. I got to put it in a D. It's, it's just something where they went so far out of their way to make it so that it does one thing and one thing only. It only goes into the token Zindi aquatic systems. And basically the whole loop of it is go into the Zindi system, target down one battle cruiser, and win or lose and you're done for the day. Like that's basically it. It doesn't even grind the normal Zindi hostels that well. Um, I've heard some people like just on the verge of it, like if you're low, if you're like 41, maybe it's better than your Epic at doing it, but not really. And that wouldn't last beyond that. So it's really, it's only purpose is to kill the Zindi Aquatics. Um, and that's it. The, it does have one nice thing on it, which I'll say is the ship ability that shows you a deep space system or a, a dark system for a while, for a minute. So that's just nice for people that need to like largely start armadas, I think is the number one use. And people have asked for that for a while is can I, there's a system that's going to take me 10 minutes to warp to. Like if you're like a level, whatever, 44 person and you want to do an armada in a level 52 system, it will now show you that system. You can click the armada and start it instead of spending 10 minutes to warp there, get to the system, start the armada and now wait another 15 minutes. Like at least that's much, much better. Also good for things like the token mining systems. You could at least peek in on like Mining Monday, like look in the system before you go to it to make sure that there are open nodes in the first place. Um, so that's gonna save you some time. So I like that, but the ship itself is just garbage. Like it has, I don't think there's ever been a more niche ship that it's designed to kill one hostile. And that's it. Not even the other hostels of that type. It's like one subtype of one hostel for a loop uh, is kind of annoying. Uh, but ultimately, the refinery attached to it and the Xborg research that you're going to get from that, all of that looks pretty good. There's some efficiencies in that research tree. There's some uh, new stuff like ships repairing between rounds, a fraction of the damage you've taken. Um, extra combat stuff, accuracy, extra crit chance, crit damage, things like that are all in those trees. Uh, and that's going to be pretty valuable. There is also going to be apparently a moan, and I don't know what the amounts are like yet, but once you get the skin for the NX-01, then it is also going to be giving you par steel, dilithium, and tritanium on a daily pull, including the six star stuff. So I think that's more maybe even targeted towards them, but that would help. Similar to the Monavine, you're eventually going to need a lot of that stuff. Uh, and also in that refinery, there's the Hugh officer who is looks like he's going to be good when he's like tier five, but looks like it's going to take so long to get to that point and you need so many epic credits to get that far that it's like theoretically this is a good officer but okay i'll tell you in three years when i've got it at tier five um so it's just kind of a weird one i think they could have done so much more with it um like the fact that you're not even using it to do the normal zindi grind is do, just doesn't make sense to me and it doesn't seem to have any value outside of that and uh so i think that was a disappointing ship but it's kind of one that you're going to want to get you may not want to go to your way to buy this though it does have a free-to-play path from day one um and it would take you i think it's about three and a half months to get uh, there was a way i think they gave you uh 10 10 blueprints and five from missions so if you start with that then you're going to be uh 
you know, it's still going to take a while. They did this thing again where you get 15, but it takes 200 now to build the thing instead of 100. So you're still going to be like three, four months to get that unlocked. And anyway, um, so yeah, if you haven't bought it and you don't really, really feel the need, particularly if you're low 40s, don't feel a rush to buy that. It's not crucial. Just grind it out and uh, and see where you get to. Um, now we get to the next tier of faction miners. These ones I think are really good. Um, I don't know. I'm going to put them in the A category actually. And all three of them because I think basically it's the same thing. It's just a matter of which one you get based on who you're killing. Uh, you don't need to buy these with faction credits either. You probably will collect a lot of the BPs in your normal hostile grinding. So you can get these actually in the capital system. So like Kronos, Saul, and Romulus. If you kill there a lot, the uh, the transport ships, the surveys uh, that are level 49, you're eventually going to get a lot of these BPs. And as you kill, I think it's about 46 plus hostiles in deep space, you're going to be getting these as well. Um, and again, they drop relatively regular. Like I would say if you kill like 100 hostiles, you'll get like three or four. Um, so it will take a little bit, but you're going to get them for free enough that you probably don't need to be spending faction credits on them. Uh, but the real benefit to these is, one, they can get a little deeper than the previous miners. They've got pretty good cargo capacity, and they've got quite good protected cargo capacity. So... They get a lot. Of, they get the faction bonuses because they're faction miners. Um, they also can be equipped with refits that make them doubly good for different types of materials. So if it's designed uh, for the gas, you can do gas and ore, and it's got a bonus to both sort of thing um, with the refits attached to them. But they're fine on their own, even if you don't end up uh, getting those things. The other really, really good thing to them, and it's going to depend on whether you've got access to it, but if you get enough uh, of the rare materials to be able to take these, most people would take it to about like a tier six or seven. I think at tier seven, they can start to reach the lowest uh, five-star systems to be able to mine the five-star resources. If you can get it to a tier 10, they can now reach the token systems for five star. So basically, if you've got enough of the rare materials and ship parts, the rare survey parts to get it to tier 10, uh, which is probably going to assume that you've got some efficiency or something, um, then you don't actually even need a five star miner. And I think that's one of the benefits to it. And I would even argue, and I have argued with uh, people uh, about this, that as long as you have access to that, then they are literally better than a Nova. Um, and the reason that they're better than a Nova is because they actually get the faction bonuses to the protected cargo that the Nova doesn't get. So while their capacities are going to be about the same, I've got them at about a maxed out ones at about 38 million. I think my Nova is like 40 million. So very, very similar. But the maxed out faction ship has a protected cargo of like six or seven million and the Nova is only at like two million. So it's three times as much protected because it's faction. Uh, and as long as you can get it to tier 10, then it has the warp range to get into the token systems. And once you can get into there, you really don't need to go any farther than that. And then that can be the thing uh, that is collecting for you. And if you are in a situation that you have OPC hunters on your server, you're at a war, you're whatever it is, um, then the fact that they have much higher protected cargo is going to be really useful to you. And the Nova, um, which I'm already getting ahead talking about, the Nova itself is really expensive to repair. So if you're in kind of a situation where people are hunting your stuff, the Nova takes, it's 20 times as much to repair it uh, compared to a maxed out like tier 12 uh, faction miner in terms of the Tritanium and stuff like that. So I think these are really good and you're going to use them for a long, long time because you're going to end up getting it in your low to mid 40s uh, and then you're pretty much like, again, at 59, I'm still using these every single day. Um, so uh, I think they're still valuable. 
Now we are on the 42 faction ships. Going to start with the Katinga. Um, here's where you start to get to the nothing is bad, but I got to consider it relatively to other things. And I think in terms of the relative to other things area, um, the Katinga, which used to be really, really good and used to probably be the way you would go in PvP when it was just the original strike teams, is now a lot lower on the list. Um, it's slower and impulse speed tends to be winning out more these days. And also the round one is not that strong. It needs to get to round two to fire some of its bigger weapons. So it's still relative, like again, it's not bad at this point, but it's just not as good um, as some of the other options. So again, out of the three, I'd probably, I'd say Katinga's number two. The Kelvin, uh, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna put it at the same category, but it's almost a C minus sort of thing, but it's not quite bad enough to be a D. Like if you get this, you're not like, screwed or you haven't hurt yourself or anything if this is the route that you went um and again because it's an interceptor pvp is lean towards interceptors now with the current meta but the firing pattern sucks it kind of just sucks it's not that strong a ship um the only things going for it are the interceptor and the speed part of it um and it doesn't feel like it has natural synergy with the game and the one that I think does, and I'm going to put into the B tier, is going to be the Valdor. And the reason I say this, and I talk about the natural synergy with where the game is trying to push you, is the way the jellyfish works, if you've got the jellyfish, will unlock the events that give you explorer parts. And then you're going to use those explorer parts, not on the jellyfish, but on your Valdor. So you're going to have a much higher income of explorer parts and ship parts are going to be the hard thing to get with these things. Also, the Katinga ship parts, you're going to be competing with them for the cube, for the mantis um, and some other things. And the Kelvin is going to be kind of competing as well with the Talios. The only thing that the Valdor competes with, I think is gonna be the, the Voyager, but the Voyager doesn't take that many parts compared to some of these other ships. So the, like the cube takes a lot. Uh, it just takes the nor like almost a normal amount for uh, a faction ship. So it can kind of be a hog for that sort of thing. Um, but I feel because you've got extra income for it, and I think the firing pattern is just a little bit better, uh, it also has a cloak ability that you can get through the faction store that can definitely help you just continue to do your uh, dailies and whatever. And the Explorer is pretty decent uh, in the PvP as well. I think it makes the Valdor a fair bit better uh, compared to the other two options. And again, the last pick I, I would say is the Kelvin. Uh, I wouldn't say to go in that direction at all. Um, next up, we've got the 46 ships. And here there's a clear winner, um, but it is not the Coronar. The Coronar, though, I'm going to say is still pretty good. So I think compared to the 42s, the Coronar has, I guess what I'd say, a weird firing pattern that was designed for a longer fight. So it takes to round four before all weapons hit at once, and it kind of staggers to that point. And that's the point it hits. In PvP now, things don't make it to round four. They could later, like the meta could change or whatever. Um, but it's just not, we're not getting there now. So I think that the coroner is kind of leaving a lot on the table. That said, it's still a pretty good ship. Like its base stats are pretty good. Um, being an explorer is fairly decent. Again, you could, if you didn't go, you're obviously not going to do both of these. You're not going to do Valdor and then Coronar. You're going to want to switch ship types. But if you did not do the Valdor, then going the Coronar for your level 46 might make sense because, again, distribution of ship parts and what you need, it may work out better that that's the direction uh, that you're going. So it's a good one, but it's not the best one. Um, the worst ship, and it's almost down here with the damn Intrepid, is one of the worst ships 
in the game really is the Newton. Um, and one, just slow speed, terrible PVP pattern. The way that it fires is not good at all. It takes a while to ramp up. Um, PVE, PVP is just biased against the battleships now anyway. I don't think it's a good grinder. Just again, the way that it fires, it's not ending things in round one and two. It's trying to get too deep uh, before you end it. It's competing with a number of things. They're using the same uh, parts. I just don't think it's the way to go. I, I've never seen, it seems to be one of the least popular that you see out there anyway. It used to be a little stronger again when PvP was pro battleship, so things can change, but I just think that's the worst of the three by quite a bit. It's one of the more disappointing ships uh, that's out there, especially when you then compare it to a Pilum, and the Pilum is essentially S. Um, I'm going to it's got one of the best firing patterns and the Sanctus eventually copies the same pattern, but it's got a fire every weapon in round one and then fire most weapons in round two, then fire everything again in round three. It's just got a front loaded heavy pattern. It's an interceptor, so it goes really fast. That's the best PVE thing right now anyway. It's got good piercing it's it's just a good ship build in general and i think there's been a consensus on that for quite a while but now that the pve pvp has shifted even more in that sense uh it's even stronger the other thing that in pve advantages interceptors is compared of the three abilities the thing that helps you most in combat is having hull breach on your opponent as long as you're not doing like a towel burn down sort of thing in which case your damage doesn't matter but the, if you're fighting armadas if you're fighting hostiles anything you're fighting having hull breach on it is going to help you and everyone else in the armada but then that thing also being the thing that activates all your artifacts to increase your isolytic damage is also helpful. So just everything, it fires everything up front. It benefits from all the best PVE, benefits from all the best PVP. The Pelham is just dominant. Like there's no debate against uh uh, in terms of which one wins this one, it's the Pelham completely hands down. And I think it's one of the most powerful ships for its level in the game. And even beyond the for its level part, um, you can punch up insanely with a Pelham against a number of things, just the way that it's designed. The special ability of all three ships in this category is to give you extra loot from the hostile uh, that you're fighting and loot does include faction. So you will be using these 46 ships even well beyond uh, 46 because they can be your faction grinder and give you a bonus uh, in that category when you're using that ship just because, and the more you tear it up, the more that bonus is, but you can be getting, you know, a hundred plus percent bonus from using uh, these uh, faction ships. And uh, they're really quite good. They have a lot, of, you'll, you'll be using them for, you know, six months to a year plus that they'll still be in your rotation because uh, they are quite strong. And a lot of that is because you're probably going to be skipping this level of ship, which is the 50 epics. They're not terrible, but they're kind of terrible. This one, the Hecta, is going in D as well. The Hecta has a really, um, again, it has a terrible firing pattern. It has this really staggered, slow building firing pattern that makes it just not good. So even though things are generally interceptor biased at the moment, its firing pattern does not play into that. It's not like the Pelham, it's not like the Sanctus where it's firing everything at once. It's quite the opposite. It's like this fragmented nonsense pattern that I, I really don't like. Um, and the fact that you just 650 BPs to build this thing is crazy. And it's not that much of a jump up from where the other ships are. The other things start at like 40, 40 million power. These things starting at like 50, 60, just not that much bigger. They get a little bigger by the end, but it's not... It's just not that much bigger for how much it costs and how much you'd have to put in to tearing these things up. It made sense when they were the highest ships in the game. They're not anymore. Skip them. It's, and even 
you're just so many BPs, you're not going to get them from chest or you're not going to get whatever. It's either you're going to spend, you know, a million plus credit. I think it's like one and a half million credits to get them. You're just not going to do that. Um, so you're probably going to skip it. If you did get one, it's probably going to be the Enterprise A, which I would. Eh, no, nah, it's even still a C. Um, again, it's not that much stronger. It's an Explorer that's like semi durable. It doesn't have like, you know, the shield ability of the original uh, 34 Epic one. It's just kind of okay. Um, yeah, just, just not that impressive, decent, nothing special. You're probably going to skip, unless you just somehow randomly get a lucky 650 pull, don't build it, forget it, like leave it alone. Um, and the Tribune, probably the same thing. This one has at least a slightly interesting ability that if your opponent has burning on them, it increases the number of shots that the weapons do. And that's interesting because that is a flat damage increase um, beyond, like a lot of other ships will have like a, this gives you a 25% damage increase, but an extra shot means that it gets all the other bonuses that you've got added to that extra shot. So if you usually do four shots and you now do five, it's like really a 25% increase, not a 25% on paper, but in reality it's 1% increase. So the Tribune at least, if you were gonna get one of these three, and you can probably see these are from my account. So I've got 300 and something of these. I've just been doing the away team poll one a day for like basically a year uh, on these and then occasionally get it from the, uh, you know, the Armada chest and stuff like that. You'll get a blueprint or two. So eventually I'll get this just because the Tribune, it also just looks cool. I think it's one of the cooler looking ships uh, out there, but definitely you're not going to, like in the time it took me to get 316 of these things, I've gone from level 49 to 59. So to give you some sense of the, the time scale. Uh, on that, it's just not worth doing. The Nova, I don't love, um, but it's good. The thing about the Nova is tier one is enough. So you can build a Nova and you will, again, you'll get BPs now from the Armada chests. You can get BPs quite rarely from killing high freebooters um, or just other high level ships. You will, like I didn't buy any of these. Um, one, two, 150 of my second one. I got the first one for free as well. You don't need to tear the thing up. It's already got enough warp to get to the token systems to get to um, a decent amount into the five-star space. And it's got a pretty good cargo size right off the bat. Um, so you don't really need to tear it up. I still like high-level four-star miners better than the low level five star one. And I think again, one of the reasons which I talked about before is that the five star independent miner doesn't get faction bonuses. And because it doesn't get faction bonuses, it's expensive to repair. It doesn't have good protected cargo. It's not mining as fast as you would think that it should. You would expect there to be quite a big jump up in terms of mining speed. There just isn't, they're within uh, like a tier 10 one of these versus a tier one one of these it's about the same uh i think i've got mine at tier four now and it's maybe 10 20 percent faster something like that um and you don't need to really tear it up but if you don't have the resources to be able to do this and it does take like i said a lot of rare um that you may not be there so if you're early in your 50s and you haven't gotten these past like tier seven, and you want something that can get into that token space, then yeah, build a Nova. The one good thing, you can use any of the three faction credits to do it. So if you've locked all your factions at one billion, take the one that you don't intend to move up much further, or not now, bump it to 1.1, spend all your faction credits on the Nova, get one quickly and then let it go back down again. So you can do that probably in a day, um, get it up, waste those credits. Then you've got the other two factions still for your faction chips and you've spent your, I did it with Klingon, uh, raise Klingon to 1.1 billion, 
bought a Nova uh, or what was left of it. I think I needed like 30 blueprints at the time I did it and, uh, and then just tanked it again and, uh, and forget about it. So you can do that. You probably don't need multiple of these. And again, don't waste resources on tearing them up. Uh, I, like I said, I took mine to tier four, but I didn't even need to do that. I just kind of, I thought it would get better than it did and it didn't. Uh, you really don't need to tear it. Uh, certainly to be using like uncommon stuff that you need. Uh, you can, you can just leave it. Uh, then into the level 53 ships, the North cut is one of the worst ships in the game. Um, it's the most like disappointing, terrible, like it might as well again be made of paper mache. It's a piece of, <laughs> it's a piece of garbage. It's just strictly worse than the Pillum. Like they're both interceptors. It's firing pattern is so much worse in the innate ship stats are so much worse that if you just took two out of the box, same crews on them, and I think ran them into each other, especially with the way PVP is now, the Pelham at 40 million should destroy a North cut at like 140. It's that different and it, they're that bad. It's re just really bad. <laughs> if you take them out of the box and just did that, that it, like it's just bad um, that I think the North cut fires once in the first round and it's just not good it's heavier weapons hit later and whatever I, I just don't advise doing it um if you haven't done an interceptor coming like if your last ship was an explorer like the corn or something you want an interceptor i'd almost look at can i hold out until you get to the next level to do it because the north cut is not it just ain't, isn't the jam um and usually, again, I'm on the side of interceptors. The North Cut sucks, absolutely sucks. Um, the Vorcha is a bit more tanky. Uh, I'll probably put that in the C category. I think it's just the standard, what you would expect. But things are slightly, like I said, against battleships now. Um, but it's pretty good. It's going to be fine. You can grind with it. If you're not worried about PvP anyway, um, you know, it's good for Armadas. It's good for hostile grinding, whatever. Uh, you're going to be fine with that. The um, It's, again, not a front-loaded firing pattern, but it's not like a super back-loaded one either. It's not like a meandering. It just doesn't fire everything all at once, but it averages okay. If you're in three, four-round com combats, it's fine um, as a hostile grinder. But I think the clear winner for this one, and I wouldn't put it higher than a B, uh, is going to be the Corvus. I think it's just it's a good amount of tanky, it's got a pretty good, um, pretty good firing pattern. It's got a piercing ability to it. So I think the, it, it ramps up a, a fairly good type of piercing um, for each round. Um, and it's just, yeah, pretty good. Again, it is also playing into the loop of this jellyfish scrapping cycle that you're going to have the resources to put into explorer parts more than you are some of the other ships uh, that you're looking at. So I, I just think it's it's tanky, it's good, it cloaks, um, and you can get the cloaks like for free in like the event store. Unfortunately, not the faction store, I don't think, but you can do it without buying it, so that's uh, nice. So it just seems to be the good one. I wouldn't take it probably beyond tier six or seven. I wouldn't take it into the you know, rare resources uh, sort of space, but it's quite good uh, in it. And it is quite good in PVP as well. Uh, I'm still using it and you can definitely take out uh, level 56 and sometimes level 60 ships with it if you've got it crewed properly and, and stuff like that. So I think that's the winner in this category. The real takeaway there is <laughs> just don't get the North cut. The other two are fine. I wouldn't argue with anyone getting either of those two. And it just depends on what your next step is going to be. Uh, but then as we do get into the next step, these are actually all pretty good. So I don't think there's a dud in the uh, 56 space. Uh, I think that the Crozier is going into the B tier. It's got a reasonable firing pattern. It's got what I call like split rounds where it fires like half, 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 half uh, of what it does in each round. Um, and it has an ability that decreases the hostile crit damage uh, for each round that it's alive. 
that doesn't matter so much. Uh, nowadays, again, things are a bit shorter unless you're in long, long fights. That's not huge, but it, that's something. PvP, it's still actually just kind of tanky and hits enough that it's going to be okay, even though it's at a little bit of a disadvantage now. The Sompek is probably in the A category. I think it's a step above the Crozier uh, in terms of how it plays out, in terms of uh, it's another split rounds firing pattern thing. It decreases the uh, hostile piercing as it's ability however that ability is kind of useless if you're at max mitigation anyway that's not really going to do anything um but it's a pretty tanky ship it's good pvp ship um explorers are almost always just like as posted they're as strong as they say they are and that's basically all you need to know um but yeah it's a good one Again, I would never say you're wrong if you go with the Sompak. I think that's a good a good choice there. But also sneaking in with the Pilum in the S tier is the Sanctus. And if anything, it's a level, it's like, it's literally the advanced version of the Pilum. The firing pattern is identical. So it fires every weapon that it has in the first round, which is absolutely huge in PvP, that it just fires everything that it's got. But it also has one of the best ship abilities in the entire game. And that is that it drains a hostile shields by a certain percentage per round for the first five rounds. And so once you've got that to a high enough tier, mine's at tier nine now, that's 22% uh, that it's draining per round. So basically against any hostile by round four or five, it has no shields left no matter what. That's super crucial for fighting things like Q's, host uh, yeah, Q's trials or fighting anything with a large shield. It's just going to make that shield irrelevant uh, over the course of a eight round fight or something that you get a lot in those uh, Q trials, it will just knock it out. And compared to the other two abilities, which are like mitigation and crit damage, but it's only by like a few percent, um, the Sanctus one is just, it's just a ship that permanently has a Yuki on it, like a fully like synergied out Yuki on the bridge that is permanently there that just rips the shields off things, which is pretty crazy. Uh, so as that, you know, gets better, uh, as you tear that ship up, it is just completely removing, uh, shields from things, which is super, super important. Um, and like I said, PVP, it's just one of the best out there. It really does swing, uh, up against the 60 Epic ships as well. The everything about PvP is in its favor. It's just uh, it's just quite good uh, there. So I highly recommend that one. And that somewhat shapes your previous path as well. Part of the reason that things like the North Cut, which sucks anyway, aren't as good, is because you don't want to get an interceptor and then get in another interceptor in the next level. You want to be varying it up. Um, so I think that kind of plays into it as well. But the Sanctus is just so good. Uh, just trust me on it. And I think a lot of people do. Like you see that that's probably the most common thing that people get uh, simply because of that. It's if you're Even if you're not interested in PvP at all, it's the best PvE ship. Uh, it's the best. Like there's not a category that it's not winning. It's the fastest, the strongest, the most utility, the everything. So it definitely goes into that S category. Uh, up next are the 58 miners. These ones I'm going to put into a C, sim not because they're not like good or whatever, but because they're unnecessary. <laughs> they're, they cost a lot, 350 blueprints to get any of these. It's not something you're going to get quickly organically from chests and stuff. I don't know that the blueprints drop from anything. Are you... It's just a matter of are you going to spend a million faction credits at level 58 to get these things when you must have other miners that are doing just fine. You've either got a couple Novas or whatever. Like there's just no need for it um, really. Like th there's only so much resources you can consume and sending one of these into a token system to fill up like a haul of 80 or 100 million, okay, that one trip will last you for like three months, but, or you can send a Nova in twice, 
and it'll also last you for three months. So it's just you're starting to get into numbers that are just unnecessary. I don't know whether these are more necessary in the six star, but I think you end up needing to get the six star miner for that anyway, because these guys don't have a bonus for that. So I don't. I think eventually the cargo capacity becomes irrelevant, and I don't know that they mine so much faster that it matters. So it's kind of the type of thing of like, unless you've just got an absolute excess of uh, of wealth in terms of credits and everything, I don't know why you'd ever get these. I think it's something that you'd maybe when you're in the maybe when the game ended at 60, you just had so much at the end of it that people were buying these. But I can't see ever getting them on your way. Uh, it just doesn't make a lot of sense uh, to go out of your way and do that. Into the 60 epics now, uh, the Enterprise D is pretty good. Uh, and again, I think these get into the territory of like, well, none of them are bad. Um, but I think the Enterprise D probably gets into the A category. Um, it does have an ability that increases the damage it does per round, but the game has scaled to the point that that's not a lot. Um, so it doesn't really matter. It does increase the weapon damage each round, but again, who, who cares? The firing pattern isn't that good, but it's also not that bad. Uh, it's again, another split pattern of it never fires everything at once, but it just kind of alternates uh, between the types of weapons it has. It's okay. It's just a very tanky ship, um, but it's just a, on its face, it's just a strong ship. So obviously you're now getting to the levels where everything is just good. Um, and again, explorers are what they are. They're basically as strong as they say they are. Um, there's no kind of real trick to it uh, for them. The Rotaran, I think this one could be, it should be maybe higher. It doesn't have the good firing pattern that both the Pelham and Sanctus has. It's not the ideal PvP thing. Um, but it's got an interesting ability where it increases the critical hit damage each time it crits cumulative um, for the fight if the opponent has hull breach. So it can actually increase the damage you're doing in a material way. So I think the Enterprise one, which increases it by a percentage of damage, doesn't really add up to a lot. But if you're increasing the critical hit damage you're doing, it really does add to the total. And I think where some of the PvP and even some now, we're starting to see hints in PvE doing it, where like the Zindi are lowering, lowering your critical hit damage, points and whatever if you're in a longer fight and it's gaining it then you're actually maybe overpowering that to some extent i guess not against the zindi they lower it by like 500 percent per round or something but it could if you start to get longer fights in pvp start to get longer fights in pve it might matter um over multiple rounds it would ramp it up but it's uh kind of questionable um but I think it still kind of fits in the A category. Um, the last one of these, the Diderex, which I think has points for being the coolest one, um, has it actually has the a similar pattern or a similar ability to the Tribune that I mentioned earlier, where it fires more shots per round. But instead of one more shot per round, the ability says it's it starts at 0.1 shots per round. So as you tear it up, that would get better, but it never quite, I don't think it ever quite passes into the area where you'd say, okay, that's an S now. I think it's just good. The firing pattern isn't the best uh, and you would eventually get more shots, which is kind of good in PVE that you'll get stronger as the fight goes on, but in PVP, that's not gonna matter. It also is just slower. Um, all three of these are relatively quick, uh, but obviously as a battleship, it's the slower one. So people can still run away from you. Um, and I just hate hostile grinding in a slow thing. Like I'm impatient. I just want to get to the next, next thing, next thing. So it's annoying to, to have to wait for that. Um, so I think it's the worst, but I, it's compared to some of the other ones, they're not, you can't go wrong again. So they're still strong, even relative to what they are. I think the big part, if you consider just the cost, um, that's obviously a big hit. 
And I think you almost want to, and I was originally thinking once they came out with 60 plus, I'll just skip the 60 epics and see if I can go into the 63s. It sounds like, and I'm not quite there yet, but sounds like from talking to people in their 60s, it's hard to do that simply because it's expensive to run the 60 ships or 60 plus ships because they take the whole different types of resources. So it sounds like you kind of need one of these to be your hostile grinder. Um, and you can't run just the 63s because it'll cost too much and you, and you can't really do it. So I think you still need it. They're good. They're kind of the, they're all just cool uh, as well. So I'm gonna, I feel like I'm maybe being charitable putting them in an A, but I'll put them in an A. I, and I don't have them yet, but uh, you know, one of the, well, I'll just say the, one of them will be the next thing I'm going for uh, probably in a few months and it will be the Enterprise D. That's what I'm doing. Um, and it's largely again, because I've got a Sanctus now. And so I wanna go from an Interceptor to an Explorer again. And that's probably the way to go. And the Rotaran is just not good enough to surpass the intercept. Like I can kill with a 600 million Sanctus, I can consistently kill 1.5 million Rotarans, but not 1.5 or 1.5 billion Rotarans, but not 1.5 billion Enterprises. So it's just a sturdiness uh, sort of thing that the the explorers tend to be sturdier. So that's probably the direction I'm going. Uh, next is the the Selkie, which I believe is named after a hockey trophy. Uh, this one, I think you just need. Um, it's going to be your six-star miner. It doesn't look... I, I think you just need it because you need it to mine six-star uh, and you need the warp range and whatever. Looking at it, it doesn't look like the cargo capacity is like high or anything. It looks like it looks like in a lot of ways it's a downgrade, but it's for the new stuff. So it almost feels like they've just kind of reset uh, some of that. But so I'm, I'm not sure, but it seems like you just have to have one. Uh, it's also they've done something where if you want to be raiding a base and stealing the six star stuff, the amalgam doesn't work anymore. You need to use this ship or higher uh, in order to be getting six star materials out of a base. That's kind of, I know why they did that, but whatever. Um, whale protection or something. Either way, you just kind of need it, but it's not fancy. And it is similar to the Nova that it's a no faction ship. So it's going to lack a lot of the bonuses that you get from the faction stuff, but it is what it is. I know that there's some tech that upgrades this stuff specifically. So, but I'm not there yet, but I think that will be important. Then we get into these, <laughs> which are terrible. They're fucking terrible. Um, I don't know if you've, I've run across a bunch of these in incursions and stuff like that. I can tell you PVP wise, a 2 billion plus any of these is losing to a half a billion Sanctus every day of the week. Like they're absolute trash. Their firing patterns are stupid. Um, <laughs> the Minerva fires weapons in round one and then fires nothing in round two and then fires again in round three. It's, they're costly to run, they're weak as hell. I think the only thing really going for them at all is the uh, fact that you can upgrade them for like the hazards in the space and the warp range and stuff like that, but it's almost like they're from another universe in terms of the strength comparison, they are absolutely garbage. Um, so like they're gonna have a number on them like, one billion, two billion, three and a half billion, they're not. Like you might as well knock a zero off that in terms of actual strength in fighting. But I think when they're fighting the specific hostiles they're supposed to in the specific space they're supposed to, they're probably well designed for that sort of thing. But from what I'm hearing from anyone, they're expensive to run, they're crap. You can basically, you can't like hostile grind with them just because of that cost, you need something else to do it. And 
basically no one is. What seems to happen, and I, I noticed in the last couple incursions, and I noticed as we switched to the new territory season, people would take these out once, and then they'd get smacked and be like, oh, shit, that sucked. Like they didn't know that it was that weak. And because you probably build it, in, unless you're like in a war or something, you're not going to fight anyone with it right away. And it's not until you kind of get an incursion or get a territory fight or something like that where you are like, okay, I'm going to try out my new Minerva or my new Akira or something. And then someone comes along with the 56 ship and annihilates it like, like it's nothing. And then, uh, you're like, oh, okay, well, that sucks. Uh, <laughs> that was useless. And then you have to, you know, leave it at home and use your other ships. So it feels like in that category. And of course, they're the uncommons. So they're supposed to be a bit weaker. But, you know, the 53 uncommons are pretty good. Like the Corvus is pretty tanky. Um, not not the North Cut, but the, you know, the Vorcha is pretty good as well. Like those are decent ships. But um, yeah, these guys again it feels like they're paper they're super costly a lot of people are almost intentionally delaying getting to this economy just because it's it's hard to run and just on everything about these ones seems seem like they suck so maybe i'm exaggerating a little with an f but i don't think i am uh, by that much and i don't think anyone that has these is like yeah they're they're awesome i'm glad that i got this you got to get one of them uh i think Given the patterns that they got, I think the one that I would probably say is is the um, Akira. Um, but again, it takes to round two to fire its best weapon. Um, but I think out of the three, like Minerva fires nothing in round two. And the Negvar is just this weird pattern that it never has a strong round. It's just like um, firing whatever um but yeah i i think out of those and then again the fact that it's a battleship but they don't seem like none of it's like this front-loaded punch or anything which may be okay for like the 60 plus hostels and the space that they're in and whatever it may be what you need but they're not uh not good combat ships and i don't even know if they just looking at them i don't even know if they'd be good for like armadas and stuff too much um just because of the way they fire and the way they act so I think they're, they're kind of crappy. Um, next up, and again, now we're getting into the things of like, I haven't even seen these out in the real world yet. So I'm just kind of looking at the stats. Uh, but we've got the Titan. Here we've got a staggered firing pattern. I think it's probably decent now. Um, but it's probably in the C. I, again, I'm marking it down a bit because it's, the cost of running it like it, as a grinder they've got to fix the economy before these are useful um and again the firing patterns are just a little weird they're different than they did for the 40s and 50s ships that they're not front loaded so they're designed for these longer fights in a in a kind of weird way the titans got kind of a staggered pattern where again nothing there's no round where like everything hits uh strong it's just kind of staggered throughout um but it seems okay. It's certainly better than the uh, 63s. Um, then we've got the Coast, yeah, what is it? Coast Carry. Um, this one seems fairly decent. It's got a pretty big round one, but then it has a blank round two. So it fires things round one, and then it fires nothing uh, in round two. But it, it's, it's an Explorer. I think it does okay. Um, and the fact that it's front loaded PVP certainly would be better. And if you get to the point that you're able to, it's always key. I bring up PVP a lot and like how round one is so important, but even fighting hostiles, ending something in a round one fight is usually super important as well. And there's a lot of things that like, it just cuts down the response fire that they get or any like ability that it's gonna do or whatever. If you can just shut it down round one, it minimizes the hull damage you're taking obviously to end it quick. So even in PVE, that front loaded damage is uh, I think super important. Um, the Velox, this one has a pretty good firing pattern again it's not super everything right away but it's pretty consistent and there's no like super weak round two so i think that goes into the b category 
you know, this is a long ways away, but if I had to pick one now, that one's probably the one I would do is the, the Velux. Uh, then we get into the miners for here. I, again, I've never seen these. I'm just going to say they're probably a B. Um, and I would kind of probably ask the same thing of like, what's, is it just the warp range you're looking for or are they better than the, uh, the Selkie? But the fact that these are then faction miners probably does make them a bit better because they would then have some of those bonuses, uh, that don't apply to the other things, but I don't know how the research is working in the 60 plus categories to be able to say that definitively. And then they're weirdly at, uh, 320 BPs uh, for each one. So they're still going to be pretty expensive. But if you're the type of person that's near 68 now, expense is probably not a thing that you're, you're too worried about. Um, you know, sell one of your yachts and buy one of these. Then we get to level 70. And I think there's like one person that has one of these. Um, so again, you can't see them out there. Uh, but we've got the Enterprise E. And these are weird the fire I've never seen firing patterns like this. They take six rounds, all three of them take six rounds before they fired every weapon. But they have a I'll just show you these ones because it's it's almost doesn't make any sense. Um so the way that this one works is and I'm sure no one's too concerned about this because you're like, okay, I'll worry about that in four years. Um super weird though. So round one, so it's got five weapons round one it fires one of them round two it fires two of them but it fires this heavy weapon that they call the decimator on the enterprise e and then the ability on the ship is each time if it has morale and it fires the decimator then it increases the kinetic weapon damage by 2000 whatever percent and of course that'll go up presumably as you tier the ship or whatever uh, and there's 18 tiers on these things. So yeah, uh, there's the bonus right there. So actually it doesn't go up that much. Uh, so from 2100 to actually only 2360. So that's a lot less than I thought it would be. Um, only goes up 2% per level. Um, kind of lame. But either way, that's reasonably significant for each time the decimator hits. So 2,000% 2, 2, per round. And then once that weapon fires and it only, it skips round one, but then it will fire every round. And if you look at the power of that weapon, it's reasonably, uh, it's the same as the rest. So the big weapons are actually weapon one and two, which is 14 and 18 as the minimum. Then you've got 10, 10, and then the decimator is only 11. So the big weapons are one and two. But weapon two doesn't hit till the fifth round, and weapon one doesn't hit till the sixth round. And then six rounds is like, these are pretty big rounds. So that's just weird that that's that, uh, there's never been anything that's that delayed in a player ship. There are hostels that are kind of have this sort of like, I do something in round six, seven, eight, uh, or around 10 or whatever but there's never been a player ship that I'm aware of that does this sort of thing. So that's just kind of weird. And they all do it. So it's the exact same ability here instead of the decimator, it's the incinerator. And it's weird that they made them carbon like copies of each other. Um, but again, same exact pattern here that it waits to the sixth round. The crunch is a tiny bit different, but the same pattern, but you'll see that it does two shots of some of them uh of these heavier ones but it's the same gimmick that now it's the disintegrator and it does the exact same thing with the exact same percentage that seems weird because they've never done that where they just give everything the exact same ability and the exact same pattern so it's like well i don't know just pick one there's no difference so i find that odd um but yeah i basically would say then that the Crenshaw is probably in the same category of a B and I would probably put the scimitar in a B because there's really nothing whatsoever to differentiate them between the scimitar. If anything, the fact that it fires those big weapons twice, but late makes me say they've probably compensated the other ones to be weaker than 
knowing that it'll hit big later, which actually makes it weaker up front even more so. Um, so I'd say that's probably the one you wouldn't get, but I don't know. I'm surprised at that, that the last ones are so delay fire focused because it's kind of what in the game would you be fighting? Usually by the time you get to like level 60 or something, there's no hostiles in the game that are hard anymore anyway. Like you're already, you've already out leveled the game. You can basically solo the biggest armadas in the game and stuff, which I like already can. So who am I fighting at level 70 with a scimitar that I'm having eight to 10 round fights with? Uh, you'd think that you're killing things like relatively quickly. So it's weird that it's not front loaded um, in that way. But again, maybe it's totally different. Maybe they have have designed things that do go into that sort of extent, but I don't know. Again, I don't think anybody's there or maybe one or two people are there. Uh, and they're not too concerned about that sort of thing, but whatever. So there's all 91 ships in probably excruciating detail. Um, <laughs> I did this before with like, there's half the number of ships as there are officers, but I think there's almost more to talk about with each ship um, and all like the facets of how they can be used. So this is really long, but uh, people didn't seem to mind that the last time I did it. So, and hopefully because I did this in shipyard order, if you're like level 34 and you're like, well, I don't care about level 70 ships, then hopefully you're not even listening to me right now. And if you're level 58 and you're like, well, yeah, I don't need to hear about whether the Vok list is good, then hopefully you could uh, skip ahead to that sort of thing and just focus on the part that's kind of relevant to you. Um, but yeah, hope people found this useful in some degree or whatever. Um, and hopefully they don't go add another ship to next week that, you know, makes me need to add something to it. But uh, let me know in the comments bef below if you uh, agree with some of this, disagree with it, if you've had different experience with the ships, if you think I undervalued something, overvalued something, if you found something was really useful in your, like, come up um, or whatever, then, yeah, let me know. Uh, particularly on things that I, like, am like, this is trash. Like, I don't like the cube. I don't like, you know, these guys down here. Maybe you found the Franklin useful. Maybe you, maybe you're in the sixties and you're like, actually, these aren't that bad. Uh, and I do like this or, or whatever. Uh, maybe you've made the sarcophagus valuable. I never did. Um, let me know. And uh, same with, if you, I was pretty stingy on the top. I really do think there's only Voyager maybe could have come to S, but uh, but that's about it. I, I was pretty stingy on the S tier. If you think there's anything else that should be up here, I often have bias against mining. I know some people mining is way more of their game, and I'm really biased towards PvP. If there's something that maybe has incredible PvE applications that doesn't translate that I've written off, you know, let me know that as well. Um, but this is, I think generally what I think, and I think it would help you plan ahead. It's always good. Like as I was going through myself to look, not just at what the next thing I was going to do, but does it fit with the next two or three things that I was going to do in terms of building ship type, um, like where to go in the battle triangle, what my faction's going to be at, whether I'm going to have credits for this or that, you know, you want it to, I, I often alternate it between, Federation and Romulan, but I also was alternating between Explorer, Interceptor, Explorer, Interceptor, which I plan to kind of continue to do. Um, so maybe you've kind of picked one and gone ahead. Maybe you're trying to get things from all three factions. Maybe you're like, I only want Klingon ships just because they're cool. Like whatever it is, obviously, uh, yeah, let me know what you think. And thanks for watching.